Hello, and welcome to Ben Yo Chats. If you're curious about the world, this show is for you. What is happening in the world of climate tech VC investing? On this episode, I speak to Sophie Purdom. Sophie writes the Climate Tech VC newsletter and is an impact investor. We speak about the landscape of climate tech, innovations in areas she finds exciting, and how knocking on doors and being helpful started her off in climate impact. Hope you enjoy the show. Please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast. Thank you. Be well. Hey, everybody. I'm super excited to be speaking to Sophie Purdom. Sophie co-writes a climate and innovation newsletter read by tens of thousands of people, Climate Tech VC. You should subscribe. She is a venture capitalist investor. She's worked in startups as an operator. And I first met Sophie in person as she was showing me around her ag tech startup near Boston. She's all around brilliant. Sophie, welcome. Oh, such a kind introduction. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel the same. Great. So how do you think you view your origin story? You are currently in VC. You've come into climate impact investing. But how did you get there? And what attracted you to this area rather than any other part of kind of uh, the climate ecosystem? Great question. Um, I think for me, it's always been climate through and through. Um, as opposed to maybe some functional specific areas of expertise like investing or consulting or being, quote, being an entrepreneur. Um, It's been this theme that's cut through all of the different threads I've been lucky enough to to be a part of and explore. So to make that tactical and practical, um, I, I, I feel as if I've been rewarded every time I've done uh, and every time I've, I've helped others succeed within climate, whether that's saving enough money to hire new teachers, right, through an energy reduction program or um, making the Rhode Island government look good from a uh, uh, resiliency type of piece of legislation to helping set up an ESG fund at the at a endowment. Um, and now to helping support climate founders at the earliest stages of their company formation. I, I I'm lucky to get the impact itch and, and be able to scratch that, but really it's also um, self-reinforcing in some ways, right? Of uh, I'm granted, you know, I'm, I'm receiving praise and I'm granted opportunity and I'm given a bigger stage to work on over and over again. So to me, climate's been a career accelerant at the same time as, um, uh, being an impact lover for me that I care about personally. And I don't know, I don't, I don't feel like people necessarily talk about that as much about um, uh, we're all, we're all people, right. And all of these uh, external factors and signals like really do very much play into our day-to-day decision-making. And um, I think it's only fair to say that, that I've benefited in large part because people reward me for also working on climate. So I'm hardly a, I don't know, entirely do goody savior. Um, it's been uh, self-reinforcing as well. Importance of incentives. And do you think growing up in Massachusetts, I think it was at Acton, Massachusetts, did that yeah. kind of particularly teach you anything? Although, and I guess you helped out with your family business to some extent. So you had the sustainability thread and climate thread, but you also had a little bit of, of business experience. And I guess being in Massachusetts is something which is kind of helpful as well. I mean, certainly, right? I moved from rural England through to um, great school systems in suburban Massachusetts and was lucky to go through that system from 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 day zero um, with amazing, you know, uh, public school teachers and a bunch of resources. And as a kid, I it also, you know, allowed for uh, more interaction with nature and maybe silly little things like, for example, um, uh, this is going to make me sound totally nuts, but um, a uh, one day a teacher was devastated because they had hit an animal on the road and and didn't know what to do with it and probably should have left it there for the uh, highway people to clean up, but instead chucked it in the back of their pickup truck, brought it to the school where I was doing some overtime stuff with our amazing environmental science teacher and. Uh, we jumped into action and we were like, wouldn't this be so interesting if we preserved 
the skeleton of this, I think it was a raccoon or something, um, using dermestid beetles. And so we like rigged it up. this makes me sound totally loony, but you know, whatever, dealt with the animal and then put the beetles in this container and put it under an air hood and left it for a couple of weeks, came back, lo and behold, got a perfect skeleton of this raccoon. Um, uh, I definitely didn't tell any of my friends that I was doing this in a back room until like the project was done and then uh, somehow made it a cool thing. And we ended up preserving a whole bunch of different animals that way, including our largest one was a deer, which we had to get police approval for so that we weren't seen as, you know, uh, uh, preparing to be serial killers or whatnot. So um, I don't know, silly little story of like, uh, find different ways where your environment impacts you. And I just feel very grateful that there are folks around me that were encouraging me to do bits like use domestic beetles to preserve roadkill. Um, but, but you know, there's manifold examples, examples like that. And um, yeah, I've heard um, crazier, but maybe not that much crazier <laughs> in terms of high school projects. And you were at the Providence office um, doing sustainability stuff. So I guess that's kind of local state government. Did that also teach you something about sort of, I guess, that part, regulators? Yeah. You know, what the state can do or anything, or is that more passing? Yeah, no doubt. Um, so I was lucky to have this experience with the, you know, finding folks at, in my in my hometown ecosystem that were encouraging of my environmental pursuits. Sure, the domestic beetle thing, but then it actually became more serious. And we did this large energy reduction program and we saved enough money to hire two new teachers. And that meant we were then able to um, uh, hire a energy czar for the school district and then help pass some legislation to allow for for that hiring like line item budget across the Massachusetts um, school system. So had 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 a taste going right into college of how legislation and policy impacts climate at home, right, or in schools, and knew I, I wanted to do more. So instead of kind of sticking with campus things, I went straight downtown. Providence is a tiny place. It turns out if you just show up enough and like knock on the door and make yourself helpful, then you can you can, you can can get through the door most of the time. And that was my experience um, with the Office of Sustainability and another amazing woman that was was game and was open for, you know, a climate go-getter to, to hustle. Um, She's been now in charge of large parts of the Nature Conservancy and and has a really inspirational career. Um, And so we got started working on things like recycling programs and like municipal waste management and collection of different light bulbs and and the the dirty behind the scenes impactful things uh, from the municipal perspective. Um, And then that allowed me to to, um, be involved in the conversation when the resilient Rhode Island Act was set up many years ago at this point, which is the first time that there was really business intersecting with climate legislation. And Rhode Island being the ocean state, that meant mostly related to sea level rise um, and resiliency planning and what that meant for small and kind of like mid-sized business owners. And um, my job was to go communicate some of this to to the businesses um, and uh, maybe case in point of like over and over again, I keep circling back to this piece about like communicating climate from a business and bottom line perspective. Um, so it's cool to retrospectively look back and, and find that thread running through everything. That sounds great. A great advice as well. Uh, just knock on doors and be helpful. <laughs> it seems like <laughs> quite a good thing to do. So fast forward slightly to today and you're doing uh, investment now, uh, venture capital investment and commenting about it. Where do you think we might be underinvested, apart from obviously mm. all of climate tech, but uh, any other particular where we're underinvested? And maybe relatively, is there anywhere that you think conversely we might be a bit overinvested, as in actually we think we should focus a little bit more there, or this is where you think innovation is really needed? Yeah, spot on. Um, so we track all of this in, in uh, quite assiduous detail. So at Climate Tech BC, which folks see as a, as a newsletter, but on the back end is really a um, data and insights platform. We track all of the deal activity, mostly in, in, in the venture capital, so early early equity space, um, and uh, do it very bottoms up. So look at the companies and categorize those as what industry or space, you know, we have 200 or so sub-industry verticals, and where's the capital flowing? And so then we can, you know, 
compare that against where the greenhouse gas is coming from. And to me, that's the way that you would calculate the gap. Um, and so we can say quite definitively, and I'm curious if, uh, if this resonates with you, Ben, but um, quite definitively, there's an abundance, shall I say, of capital flowing into electric vehicle original equipment manufacturers, so EV OEMs. Um, that spike probably happened 18 to 12 months ago now, kind of beginning of pandemic times when there was a rush in of ESG capital looking for places to park it. And I like to say the, the Tesla, Tesla elevator effect or escalator effect of um, Tesla's kind of the one and golden breakout child of ESG slash climate and big financial returns. And so everyone's like, all right, let's go find the next Tesla. <laughs> and so then you have Rivian being like heavily financed. And then it's like, all right, what's the next Rivian? And then you go down and down the stack. Um, anyway, can, can help quantify some of that, but definitely abundance there versus the other side where massive amount of, of global emissions come from with lots and lots of really complex chemical and physical like infrastructural changes that, that need to happen, which to me screams of great way of making money, um, but is underinvested in would be the industrial category kind of like writ large. So that's everything from novel chemical processes, to manufacturing to um, cement, steel, you name it. Um, we see that as the, as the biggest gap relative to emissions. And then I'll also toss one other segment out there, which doesn't quite show up on that emissions comparison graph, but that's because it should be in the negative emissions category, which is all things CDR or carbon dioxide removal. Um, it's been a hot investing space for about the past six months or so, but before that it was, it was, it was trivial and uh, really underweighted. It's still seen as relatively catalytic. So we've got lots of semi-philanthropic organizations that are helping to, to seed this and, and novel mechanisms like advanced market commitments coming in by the likes of Stripe and the Frontier Fund. Um, so I'd point that one, that one out as well. And then of course, many thoughts on where are the frontier next most interesting areas to invest. Sure, yeah, I agree. I think that Tesla effect has put a lot of capital in that is in fast followers or maybe not even that fast followers. Uh, and I also agree in the places that you think are underinvested. And obviously you had that Stripe led in fact, very well covered by Climate Tech VC. Uh, with Nan's work, uh, all of that. I, I think I agree that too. I would maybe put a little extra category kind of on the land use clump, uh, which obviously is not so directly uh, VC relatable, which is maybe one of the reasons why it's perhaps a little bit uh, under in, in terms of that. Um, but I think I broadly agree. And then within that, say, industrial complex, are there any particular areas you are also most excited about or maybe some companies and things that you've seen? Because like you say, there's, you know, hydrogen power, this or steel and cement. There's circular ways of thinking about concrete. There's heating and cooling, uh, industrial gases. And, and I know you've covered some of them, but is there anything that you're kind of and we'll need all of it. But is there anything which got oh, that's that seems super exciting, even if it might not be the kind of. 80% win is like the one or 2% there um, that you really favor. Yeah, um, and in that industrial category to, to kind of tighten the definition that I said previously, that would be stuff like process heat and fuels, right? Like iron and steel, cement, chemicals, even robotics manufacturing, and then importantly, metals and mining. Um, so within that, gosh, uh, so many, so many, companies to kind of like tip a hat to, but maybe one would be, for example, Solugen, um, which if folks are interested, we did a, a really fun profile with the founders of, of that, um, as we like to say, gigacorn company, meaning they have reached a private billion dollar plus valuation and have giant climate impact, hence the giga unicorn piece. Um, and uh, they're essentially replacing Um, and so uh, uh, just kind of like unlimited applications and, and impact potential there to entirely decarbonize and often make it into a carbon negative process, what would otherwise be um, splitting a lot of dirty fossil fuel based, based chemical processes. So that's a fun one. 
there's a lot of decarbonizing cement kind of plays that are out there. There's a couple in the steel space. Um, and I think what we're seeing is these are capital intensive businesses to get off of the ground. They have a lot of enthusiasm, often out of the gates where super smart founders, super smart um, team, they'll kind of cruise to um, pilot scale altitude and then recognize that venture and often private equity is not the right way to finance these, these first of a kind massive pilots, which are on the order of sometimes like half a billion or up to a billion dollars worth of like steel in the ground to create a new forge or a new um uh you know cement refinery and this is an observation um the department of energy like loan program office for example stateside has been um hyperactive over the past few years behind the scenes and because things take a long time um to run through uh uh Getting the getting the pools of capital necessary at the LPO through to um, running the diligence processes, we're now starting to see some of these kind of keystone loans um, ploy out into climate tech companies, like for example, Monolith Materials, which makes a kind of carbon negative, carbon black product, which goes into everything from tires to inks, and historically is coming straight out of um, petrochemicals. They're able to make that with renewable hydrogen. And they just received a you know billion dollar loan from from LPO. So um, uh, ample opportunity from the tech, new, novel technologies perspective. Good space for VCs to deploy into early, with the recognition that the capital stack will be made up with different players, some of whom, at least stateside, seem to be leaning more towards government players. Sure, and I guess that's because a lot of VC sort of in the mini half generation before, say going back 10 years, was kind of capital light software type ideas and climate tech, deep tech is perhaps a little bit different in, in capital structure and everything. I, I wondered whether you wanted to maybe highlight how you see your kind of primary capital impact investing that you do now and differentiate it from how you see uh, so-called ESG working now. And I think ESG has become a somewhat overused word, perhaps even slightly meaningless because it's become politicized and people have, have it's entered uh, the culture, uh, woke wars, as I like to call them, um, which maybe thankfully the terms impact or VC investing um, hasn't done. Uh, but arguably impact investing, albeit with small amounts of capital, has has always been trying to be more impactful or make more of a of a real world difference. Yeah, um, I get asked this quite a lot these days with um, Musk putting ESG kind of yeah. into the news. <laughs> Peter um, Thiel as well, actually, I think maybe even more from a libertarian uh, political perspective, at least. No doubt, and uh, they're doing a masterful job, unfortunately, for the for the ESG space. Although in some ways it kind of deserves it, with um, uh, allowing the ESG myth to kind of continue for so long that there is a narrative disconnect for the you know teals or musks of the world to to um, angrily tweet out against. But we can dig into that in a minute. I'd say my like one sentence response to all of this is ESG is not impact. And I wonder, we should, I mean, we should talk about this, right? Because uh, uh, you might have a, a different perspective here, but from the, from the point of view of what I invest in, which is um, high growth technology businesses that have a climate positive impact because that then drives superior returns and opens up like novel markets. Um, uh, what we would be measuring or push to measure would be the future carbon impact of these nascent technologies like coming to scale. And that's usually in terms of greenhouse gases avoided or reduced or um, straight up removed, which is very different from uh, ESG reporting, which um, my understanding is much more closer to like corporate governance and improving the performance of the company through decision making. Um, and hiring and pricing and all sorts of things like that. So um, uh, uh, my concern yeah. with the ESG kind of downturn or myth like perpetuating is that it will um, knock out right from the start this 
new space of climate impact reporting, which looks a lot more like forecasting the impacts of these novel technologies on on greenhouse gases. And that's really just getting started. And it's super it's a super tricky space. Um, and it's getting tied up, unfortunately, at the moment with uh, with ESG reporting. Ah, yeah, that's that's quite interesting. So I, I agree ESG is not impact. And maybe we can talk about divestment or engagement also difference between uh, public and private markets, which is, you know, an intersectional problem. But that's quite interesting about how you've uh, noted. So for listeners, I guess, in US or wherever, US SEC has got climate reporting regulations coming out. And some people are saying, well, that's overstepping the mark because it's not our environmental. Other people are saying this is material for investors. And actually, because it is a physical thing, or at least part of it is, let's concentrate on the carbon emissions piece, that could fall under an impact idea as to what you're saying as opposed to purely either a policy-led or an extra financial-led thing from uh, an ESG idea and therefore it is as you point it's actually at this convergence of all of these um, both ideological and policy debate so uh, I agree that it is getting uh, caught up and to your point it's also quite early so there Mm -hmm. isn't uh, there isn't a consensus quite, for instance, on how to do some aspects of carbon accounting or mm-hmm. let alone natural capital and, and all of these things. And it would be a shame if that was uh, slowed down because it's got caught up in politics. However, I do wonder whether in, it, it was inevitably going to get caught up in mm. uh, politics because there are such big stakes involved, both from corporates and policymakers and people, as well as uh, large amounts of um money. So I think that is interesting. If you had one policy choice that you could implement, um, what would you go for? Like uh, maybe your SEC or even better, you're sort of some benign dictator of the United States. Uh, You could be the benign dictator of the world if you want this to be a global policy, but maybe we could start with the US. Is there anything (laughs) that you would do from a policy perspective that um you think would really help i mean is putting a global price on carbon on the table because if so that's probably where i would shake my magic wand but um uh that's the low-hanging fruit kind of answer here um i don't think this would necessarily be at the top of my of my stack ramp ranked like you know whatever genie in a bottle (laughs) uh opportunities but one that i've been thinking a lot about is what's the role of what, whether, whether it's it's governments or other players in getting pretty heavily involved in the um, in the carbon markets in in more force, whether that's like standard setting or verification or um, maybe even certification. I go back and forth on whether that would be helpful or not, but it's pretty evident that it really should not be like a for-profit type of player that's um, uh, uh, managing all of this, and there's room for improvement particularly in terms of like speed of bringing new standards on board, um, helping manage like uh, 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 the integration of, and this is a hot take, but like the integration of the voluntary and the compliance market, like supply Mm -hmm. and demand in some ways, um, helping pull countries into these markets alongside the corporates and individuals that have kind of been leading the way for some time. So um, um, those are more more topics about an area that it would be interesting to pull national or global policy into in uh, in more force and more specificity. And do you worry about, say, private companies going public and being subject to, say, more tick box ESG or the other way around where you have maybe brown companies or brown companies going light brown but there's a lot of pressure and so they actually go private but to owners who you would argue are less responsible owners and I guess the other way we see this is you sometimes get public uh, companies who sell assets privately brown assets and you can see the players that they've sold them to and now we've actually got a track record of some of them Um, they've sold them to less responsible players so you either get methane flaring things or they run less badly or Obviously, this the kind of the S and ESG, so like workers are treated badly, uh, as well as all of that. Or do you think that's a kind of um, overstated uh, risk, or not? 
No, very much not. I think it's understated. So um, uh, maybe we can tell, I mean, this, this concept is, is, we would call it brown spinning, right? So taking um, uh, publicly held brown or underperforming from a climate perspective assets uh, private in order to hypothetically avoid rigorous accounting and um, operate with capital providers that are less ESG inclined. Um, fascinating topic, one of the many downsides, I suppose, to divestment um, and case in point that like, if there's a will, then money will often find a way to finance these things. Um, maybe one positive example in, in the case of like reversing brown spinning in some ways is uh, AGL, right, in Australia. So um, the one of the largest like energy giants out there and billionaire Atlassian co-founder Mike Cannon Brooks uh, uh, playing the activist investor role as an individual um, coming in and, and buying up more and more percentage ownership in this business in an effort to strongly nudge slash activists, push them towards um, greener practices. And, and he succeeded in uh, getting that board vote and, and changing the outcomes of that, of that business. So that's one very rare uh, kind of splashed all over the front page of the media uh, example of how there's a way of kind of green spinning these, these private brown assets potentially back to good. Uh, but to be fair, the majority of the stories that should be being told uh, unfortunately go in the other direction. Um, uh, one that caught my eye just yesterday, um, and I'm sure we'll probably be hearing more about, or maybe we won't, and that's the story in and of itself, is um, another billionaire, Harold Hamm, is trying to take the shale company that he founded, so Continental Resources, private. They own about 83% of this oil and gas, you know, US-based company, and the idea is uh, uh, take the company private because the public market investors are so skeptical of plowing money into non-ESG aligned means that he thinks he can get a better return or cheaper capital in the private market. So just like quintessential brown spinning concept. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about it. I'm not exactly sure what you do here, right? Other than um, uh, you can't go too hard, too fast on ESG reporting re requirements, I suppose, without bringing folks along for um, the man on the management train um, and leave them leave them out because the worst case scenario is they hop off of the reporting requirements and and go operate in the dark. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you've just made me reflect that what they both have in common is it's to do with the owner. So uh, obviously in public markets, you'll tend to be more atomized, smaller holdings, then you've got large owners, and then it depends what the owner wants to do. So you have a activist owner whether you're going to call it impact activist or ESG activist I don't know but the owner's got a view of where those assets should go mm. and therefore that's that's one of the lenses and obviously it's kind of neutral as the thing but you can obviously do more or different things in private markets than public and then it depends what the owner wants to do mm. so I think that's quite interesting reflection so mm. do you think you have now an investment philosophy that holds together what you've done after reporting on this so much and what would it be and maybe uh you can or i can add on to that do you have already a kind of biggest investment mistake or opposite side biggest investment learning that you'd already have which has shaped or come out of your investment philosophy this is all emergent and i think that makes it really fun but i'm game to share where i'm coming from um so there's no grand thesis other than it's always been that like uh uh, performing well when it comes to climate considerations. So mostly on like, you know, greenhouse gas performance, if you have to really drill down into it, will drive outperformance. And that's always been the nut that I'm going after for years and years and years at this point. Um, and now happen to be doing that at the earliest stages of these like, you know, private high growth tech company um, uh, startups. Um, for me, I'm, I think we've oddly, underweighted the value that can be driven from just like very clever distribution models and just go to market strategies for these these climate technology businesses which 
it feels like anticlimactic in some ways um, uh, and like counterintuitive because that's how all good businesses are built as I was beat into my head at, at Bain. Um, but I think in climate, we've been looking for like a silver bullet type of solution of the technology will lead the way or win all or drive home all of the returns. Um, the counter side to that is, you know, the team is so wonderful and great. It's kind of the easy pre-seed venture cop-out answer. Um, and I've increasingly been looking more and more at, 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 at distribution models, which means practically um, uh, what manufacturing partners are you working with and how do you think intensely about your supply chain being resilient and and often like short and uh and often like now near short um how do you think about uh uh like the full life cycle of all of your inputs so um basically being efficient and not getting caught up in needing to spend more for the end of life use of your of your like uh product or how do you put the manufacturing as close to the point of use as possible so maybe to make this a little bit more concrete, I helped start a company called Kula Bio. That's how, how we first connected um, or got closer. And Kula is a quintessential deep tech business in that it's got a magical microbe. And this microbe can live for a long time because we energize it and therefore make a lot of ammonia, which is, of course, a beneficial um, uh, fertilizer major input in most of ag. Fertilizer, ammonia fertilizer, alternatively, is traditionally made through the Haber-Bosch process, which is really fossil fuel intensive and polluting, and you have to make it in these mega factories and then ship it all over the world, and it has long lag times, and that supply chain can get really severely disrupted. We're seeing that now with massive spikes in fertilizer prices. So, so I think investors and folks got excited about Kula because of the magical microbe, if you will, whereas my experience was the magic of Kula was the fact that we could um, distribute efficiently, we could uh, do it in small batches, we could do it in real time and get it in the hands of farmers right away on the farms, we could stabilize our prices, um, and we were just a, overall like we had a better go to market strategy working often hand in hand with some of the existing suppliers, but at better prices with better margins um, and on and on and on. So I don't know. The magic seems to be the go to market hinged on the, you know, um, breakthrough technology. So that's my little little tiny hill that I'm standing on for the month, but come back next month. I'm sure there'll be another one. <laughs> well, that sounds great. And I think that sounds like you are a great investor and, and going to continue to, to be one. Um, I was interested in this VC scene in the US, maybe a couple of uh, slightly adjacent questions. I'm kind of interested in uh, the gender lens through the whole VC industry, because it strikes me as being uh, very boy heavy. Uh, not necessarily in a healthy way. And it, it's kind of interesting, I'm picking up, because I'm not really that close to it, either in the UK, there's a much smaller UK scene, but particularly in the US. And I'd be interested in your reflections on how much of a challenge this is, whether it's overstated, understated, and, and how it is. And maybe slightly intersectional with that is, traditionally, um, there's been a very strong kind of West Coast scene, and now more recently, perhaps more diffuse in climate, I've picked up there's a kind of Miami scene, which might be a bit more crypto, <laughs> there's a kind of New York scene, and there's a New York to, to Boston one. It, is there anything geographic that's there, or are they kind of, they're kind of two things, but they may be separate? So I'm interested in your geographic reflections, because you're more of an East Coast girl, I grew up there, and actually your, your hub for your VC is New York. And then whether uh, whether my flexions just being on the outside for the fact that there seem to be fewer female VCs, although coming through, you know, your cohorts doing uh, great things, and is is that an issue? You're you're totally right. Um, representationally, there are uh, too few women, um, and there's too much kind of weighting of venture dollars and people on traditionally the West Coast now both coasts, right? Um, and you can you can cut these diversity or geographic or representation kind of metrics in all sorts of ways. And the story, unfortunately, isn't a surprising one. It's often uh, that it's 
older white guys from San Francisco that that own the own the dollars. And um, if you click further into that, often the own the decision rights at the major firms um, from which uh, new firms tend to spin out of. So there's more women in VC year over year, a couple of quarters kind of notwithstanding that trend. But um, important things to look at are who are the general partners and who's who are starting new firms and therefore get to set cultural decisions and parameters and recruiting at the at the new shop. So um, I'm inspired to be amongst a, a cohort of emerging managers that are increasingly um, diverse in representation and thought. Um, but we've got a massive, a massive ways to go. Um, not to make this a pity party, right? Because I think I've actually had, um, um, uh, I don't tend to like um, spend too much time like worrying or overthinking this because it kind of is what it is. Um, and also I've been really lucky to have a bunch of inspirational figures that uh, uh, have certainly tucked me under their wing and their male and female alike. They, you know, represent all sorts of different perspectives. Um, the main thing for me has been anchor in excellence and be additive always to the ecosystem. So don't assume that just because I'm here, I should get to play. Um, I uh, am still a little uncomfortable with the title of venture capitalist. It sounds like, you know, a really privileged position to be in. Um, I want to make sure that everything that I do is additional and necessary and really high quality. And I'm here to support the founders who are making a climate impact for all of us. Um, I was one of those people not too long ago myself. And I thought really hard about um, why don't I go do that again? Um, for me, the way my brain works and the way that I enjoy spending my time, I like to connect a lot of the dots together and project where we're going and advise and help rather than being the owner of a single kind of data point on the board. Um, and I have tried to earn that position by for the past, you know, two and a half years with my team at Climate Tech VC, like add and just pour a ton of resources and everything we can back into the ecosystem in the form of all of this data and insights and um, perspective and kind of interconnected uh, nature of, of um, uh, spreading the conversations that we're lucky enough to get to have with folks to, to the public. Um, and then one other thought on, on how this is changing and how I'm lucky to be in this particular market environment. When we started CTVC, it was the, the start and the height of the stress of the pandemic. Um, and that meant everybody was at home for the first time and calendars had kind of been thrown out of the window. And for the first time in a long time, it wasn't expected that you showed up in the geography of the person that you were hoping to chat with. And that's just straight up luck for us, right? Like we were writing a newsletter people were spending more time in their inbox. They were curious, they were thinking different thoughts and were open to different perspectives. And we could just holler on the phone at these amazing change makers. So we, we made the most of that and we accelerated really quickly um, as a result of that like uh, particular point in time in the market. And now of course, you know that's changing again and maybe folks are retrenching geographically or thinning out their inbox or going back to some old like ways of working. Um, and I'm, I'm very conscious that uh, I got a chance to kind of like springboard um, from that point in time to the perspective I'm in now. And really, it's not even like paying it forward kind of thing. It's uh, uh, understanding that, that I will always take really seriously the perspective of folks that um, maybe are from an age perspective, like in a cohort uh, a couple of years like uh, after me. Um, and so I spent a ton of my time chatting with and, and putting in, into um, connecting uh, with these folks. They're an integral part of CTVC, the newsletter. I'm one of the oldest people on the team, actually, and we just don't remind anybody of that because I think they think we're all like, you know, 65 and sitting in our mansion writing this on a typewriter or something. But um, um, anyway, like diversity, distribution, like point in time, um, grateful, lucky, and all of this stuff really impacts, impacts my perspective. You could definitely see it in your newsletter as a public good or the roots as a kind of public good is like, let's spread this out, which I think comes across as very genuine and authentic and uh, really, really valuable. But do, 
what did, did the newsletter come about? Do I take even 2% credit? Because I'm sure I suggested, <laughs> hey, have you tried this newsletter thing in a uh, pandemic? It's kind of more offhand, obviously. It's actually all oh, yeah. uh, you guys. But what's that? Did that just come about because it was more time in the inbox? You're having speaking to these people and you thought, yeah, let's put it together. Everyone's going on to Substack. Let's do it. It, you're right. You're an inspiration. Um, <laughs> it, 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 uh, it wasn't even my idea. So it's entirely the, the, the first couple posts were done by my co-founder, Kimberly Zhu, um, who is, was fresh out of undergrad working at a bank and wanted to um, do something about climate. And so she set up the website, Climate Tech VC, wrote a couple posts uh, with like, I think it was like five deals of the week that she had just found online. And then then our mutual friend, Carrie Krosinski, who's a complete, prolific, polymath, ESG teacher, writer, professor, connected guy, uh, who I happen to have the privilege of writing a book with. Um, Carrie loves to connect up and coming students with people in the field. And um, he had connected me with Kim and we hit it off and she was told that she, uh, wasn't able to publish under her name because that would be a conflict of interest with the bank that that she was at. And so we popped my name on there, which uh, if you know anything about about me, I uh, I take that seriously and I like to do things well when my name's involved. So lo and behold, off to the races. And uh, it was just a, a, a marriage from Carrie introducing me to Kim, completely blind and what a delight. Um, and pretty insane to think that like a random connection would then become kind of my closest business collaborator. And we've gone way further than, uh, at Carrie <laughs> than Carrie could have ever imagined. Although he does like to take credit on LinkedIn appropriately for uh, <laughs> being the matchmaker here. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, he, he should have taken a commission that that would be, uh, that's probably what he's thinking. Oh, damn it. Like planet's going to be great, but I'm not going to see those billions. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Okay. Well, maybe we do a short section on the kind of underrated, overrated. So I just flash some things out and you can say, or you can make a kind of a comment or you can pass or be neutral. It's not, um, it's not meant to uh, catch you out or anything. So underrated, overweighted, uh, overweighted, um, lifting weights. Oh, underrated for sure. Huge part of my lifestyle, actually. Uh, used to be a cardio queen, now very much into weights. And it's helped my scoliosis. And it's a very fun way to hang out with my life partner who uh, is also busy all day on Zooms. And we go to the gym together and we lift weights and talk about our day between sets. So too much detail, most likely, but massively underrated. <laughs> Great. Um a carbon tax or maybe a carbon price, tax or price? Uh, uh, I mean, to me, underrated. Um, but it means so many different things to different people. Mm -hmm. um, so a probably reasonably rated, though it should be done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fair enough. Uh, the concept of a green new deal, although I guess this does mean different things to different people as well, but overall, green new deal. I mean, same point as the carbon tax, like it got to be done, maybe weird, like taxes and Green New Deal, like all weird wording for stuff that just makes and saves a ton of money um, and is a, is a clever and necessary policy implementation. Um, Tesla as a company. <laughs> Probably overrated at this point. Yeah. Uh, carbon offsets. Overrated. I think it's all about carbon removals. Very good. Uh, ideas of degrowth. Uh, underrated, because I wouldn't even know where to begin with that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I guess de degrowth is the idea that we are doing like too much overconsumption, but I guess some of the economists mm. or thinkers associated with that have quite draconian, or, or at least for people not on the degrowth side uh, of of thinking about that, but uh, it's still it's still in debate. Interesting. I mean, I do not think that we need to like uh, turn down the thermostat and put on a bunch of sweaters and mittens at home in order to like solve climate change. I think I'm much more of a techno optimist in that regard. So um, do more with less. I can get behind so long as that stuff that the consumer doesn't see or touch. It's more implemented upstream. Yeah. Um, nuclear power. 
underrated. Is this all nuclear power or mini nukes or advancing nukes or just in the concept in general? Um, I guess I mostly just mean like fusion as a concept. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, like, I mean, uh, there probably are no silver bullets, but if there's one or two, like I would load that up in my climate gun. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, and actually, you already commented on this, which was carbon removal. So that was my next one. So that's underrated for you, right? Underrated for me, for sure. Yes. In terms of literal pricing, I think it's literally under price at the moment. Um, and then a uh, massive area of innovation and research and talent flowing into it. We haven't even touched stuff like ocean carbon removal or all sorts of other ones um, like heat, right? Like the list goes on and on and on. And um, uh, why on earth would you purchase an offset when you could purchase a removal? <laughs> it's just like, we're talking on entirely different permanence timelines here. Uh, and you didn't call it peat tech, did you? You called it bog tech. That was the thinking <laughs> I think I picked up. I mean, that's and, gotta be an industry, right? We gotta, we gotta make that industry. That's gotta be multi-billion industry. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. We love a good pun. I think we said something like Peaky Blinders because I was deep in the Peaky Blinders oh, rabbit yeah. hole on Netflix at that point. So yeah, there's lots of yeah. good puns to go around. And it, I don't know. And the SEC thing, wasn't it something about them dropping something? That was another good one. Um, uh, drops it like it's like it's hot. hot yeah, yeah, I don't know. Or like, or something mac like. It, yeah, like macking on the marginal abatement cost curves. Like, oh yeah, you know, it, I write I write these titles <laughs> at 2 a.m. on a Sunday night. So that's the vibe. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and the last one on this, um, the woolly mammoth. <laughs> Overrated. Look, I know where he's going with that. This is like George Church's new CRISPR type of uh, play. But um, I say why uh, underrated would be the elephants that exist today and basically do the same thing that the woolly mammoths do just in Africa instead of up in up in Russia. <laughs> So you're not all the way as a crazy uh, techno optimist uh, on on that. I watched a documentary with um with him actually and Stuart Brand, and I hadn't appreciated like the complexities and the and the to and fro uh, from it, which were kind of uh, which were kind of quite interesting. But yeah, woolly mammoth, uh, I can see overrated. Great. Um, maybe uh, would you like to sketch out some current projects and things you're thinking about and i guess so you're mostly at seed and pre-seed for what you're looking at because um you know if you read on social media or even the news today there's a lot of talk about uh, a lot of venture capital being mostly frozen but particularly slightly higher up the chains so-called series a b c d and obviously ipos and public markets uh you, you can see for, for that um, but it was interesting at what you look at whether you feel the same at seed or pre-seed either in terms of what you're seeing or maybe how you think about valuation and just uh, yeah current thoughts uh for this year and into the future this is all shifting day to day, week to week right now, right? So uh, what I see at this like mid June point in time is not a slowdown in the pre-seed and seed markets, particularly for the top, call it 50% or so like founders and ideas. It's basically no difference. Um, there are fewer individual angels in the market because um, people are looking at their personal portfolios and kind of tightening the belt. Um, however, I think that the lack of slowdown in climate at the earliest stages is coming from just the enormous amount of dry powder that's been piled up over the last 18 months or so of new um, and maybe second time climate funds that have been raised. So we also track this at the newsletter and there's some cool graphics that we're going to update um, with our new mid-year report coming out in a couple of weeks. But um, we tracked last year, 64 new climate funds that were raised, um, over half of which are just entirely new institutions. That trend's continued. There's been more new institutions uh, coming into market and um, it's, it's billions and billions of dollars worth of climate dry powder that has not been deployed. Um, yet and has a really specific mandate to go after uh, some of these new innovations. So I think that's the delay that we're seeing right now in, 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 the, in the climate early market still being quite strong. Um, uh, valuations have recorrected at least 30% or so. I think that's frankly healthy 
Um, maybe folks can come and poke me after or something if they hear that and they disagree, but um, uh, it was getting pretty frothy. Um, uh, and I think uh, there's been like a, a, a bit of a sigh of relief in that regard. Diligence timelines were, it's very, it's, it's kind of loony to do a super short diligence timeline on the order of like 24 or 48 hours when it comes to these deep tech companies. Um, you simply cannot know uh, everything material that you would need to know in that time period. And um, founders should be looking for long-term partners that understand their business. So I think it's like good and healthy for everybody. I'm not suggesting we cool off all the way to put all of the power in the hands of investors, but um, uh, a bit of a recorrection there is, is good. Um, uh, but concern that there will be a, if you visualize like a snake or something that like eats a mouse and then it goes through the body of the snake and there's kind of like a lump. Um, I see climate in terms of like, there was like a small mouse that was eaten at some point and those companies are in a cohort that are now at the kind of like series B plus stage. There's not that many of them, but they're relatively large and they're performing relatively well. Then there's like a, I don't know, capybara that was eaten. That's a giant lump <laughs> that came a little bit uh, shortly thereafter. That's like this main cohort of climate companies that are now around kind of the series A type of stage, bigger N, really diversified. And frankly, not all of them are performing particularly well. And so the reckoning is gonna come for those folks when they're trying to raise series A capital on limited progress. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing that play out already in terms of layoffs of you know, uh, 30 plus percent of some of these, of these companies staff, like the non-technical non folks. Um, it's a tough time to be like a, a generalist out there. Um, and a lot of bridge rounds are happening. Um, I think that talent will be fine because they're going to get snapped up from these uh, like earlier stage companies that that maybe have a better story to tell and 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 um, are getting backed by stronger found stronger investors. Excuse me, but um, yeah, lots of thoughts. I mean, it's all it's all recorrecting and happening. But I don't I don't think it's time to run away. I actually think it's like as good a time as ever to be a climate investor and to be a strong to be a strong founder you're still in a good spot great and current projects obviously newsletter and being a vc anything else you wanted to add to that those are the two main things and hopefully always will be we're also starting a new business off the side of ctvc the newsletter which is a insights platform think a CB Insights crossed with a pitch book, selling market level information into governments and big asset owners. So stay tuned for more there. Um, and then besides the Insights business, the newsletter, the fund, uh, got to round it all out with playing a lot of handball or wall ball on the streets of New York. So it's summertime and that's my absolute favorite thing to do. Great. Uh, so between weights and handball, I'm feeling really unfit. So uh, last question, do you have any uh, advice and thoughts for people, either like life career advice, being someone in their 20s, or maybe people who want to make an impact in climate, uh, any thinking about that? Yeah, or any final thoughts you have for us? 100%. Look, there's a space for everybody in climate, and that can't really be overstated. So um, whether it's a functional kind of area that you're expert expert in, um, or if you're coming new into the market, you're excited about any particular topics or themes or approaches or mission-driven concepts that get you excited, just find the thing that works for you and run with that, because odds are that that will change, and that's totally okay. Um, but I found the biggest solve, salve, you know, the British kind of comes through at awkward times here. The biggest solve is for climate burn um, would be just, just getting started working and contributing and being a part of the, of the community. So that can be part-time, that can be remotely, that can be digitally across all of these amazing Slack communities that are increasingly moving IRL. Um, or that can be, you know, I think the best possible one is to jump in um, with both feet and start working on climate full time. Um, so tons of startups that are that are still hiring, tons of later stage companies, lots of funds, um, research entities, you name it. Uh, and if there's nothing out there, then go create it. And turns out starting a newsletter can help you get there. So um, very happy to chat with folks and beyond thrilled for this new cohort of climate first folks that maybe are coming out of studies at the moment who have always known that 
climate is a topic that's going to impact them for the rest of their lives and um, and, and, and looking forward to, to building this industry together. That sounds excellent, which brings me around to your original thought, which is knock on doors and be helpful. You can do something. Indeed, indeed. Everyone's got something to bring to the table. So help, help them help you, right? And then right. we all help the planet together. <laughs> well, Sophie, thank you very much. Thank you. Total pleasure. Very, very much fun. Looking forward to more. If you appreciate the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast.